Cool. Well, we'll get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in again on this uh, nice little Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a pretty short course, very similar to the one we had on the call options a um, couple of weeks ago. There was there was some interest in put options as well, and and why I don't, or why I haven't used them in my portfolio. Um, that's online, and and kind of what I think of them, and just a basic introduction. I've got a lot of messages about about options recently, um, for good or bad, I guess. But uh, if I can if I can kind of share what I think and and give you guys the the information, um, you know, that's that's a thing good. And options is something that I myself kind of got introduced to only pretty recently and spent a lot of time uh, doing the homework on them, doing some calculations on how they've, how they've kind of performed the risk reward on them versus some of the, what they call the call option oil equities, the highly leveraged um, risky plays out there. So, um, yeah, can everyone uh, see the screen who's on the Zoom link? Yeah, I would assume so. Um, just for full disclosure again, I'm not an investment advisor. Um, everything here is my opinion and my two cents on stuff I've researched and, and how I'm looking at these, these put options. Um, please do your own due diligence and especially your own risk tolerance with, with options compared to equities, which you can just hold forever. If they go down, you know, options will expire. That means that there's an expiry date at which point the option will basically become worthless and you can't get it back. So um, please keep that in mind with, with options, um, you know, especially in the oil space. Some of us who've been in the oil equity space for a while, we have held um, equities through the dips, you know, some, some down 90%, 95% at times. Uh, you don't have that luxury with options. Uh, once they expire, they are basically gone. So, yeah, I think that's about it. So we'll get started. Um, okay, so there's a few basic terminologies that are important to options that, that maybe are not the same as equities. And it's important to know them. Um, and again, this is gonna be very similar to the call options presentation two weeks ago. So if you're interested in those more, um, and kind of getting a review on what I'm talking today. Um, there's some more information there. So the one thing, the most important thing you need to know is the expiry date. And the expiry date is the date on which the option needs to either be exercised or it becomes worthless, or you need to sell it. So you have, you have three kind of ways you can do things on the expiry date. You, you can either sell the option um, or you can exercise the option or you, if it's not an option you want to do anything with, then it just expires uh, worthless. So any trading um, website or your bank will have the, the expiry date for the option listed. Uh, most most options, options are available monthly for like the next three months and then they go into quarterly. And then if you look at more than a year out, they're kind of every year or every six months or so. If you're trading some of the bigger names like Microsoft, Apple, and such, the, the non-oil names, they have options pretty much expiring every day, um, every Friday. You can kind of trade them very often. Um, and you know, the, the smaller, the, the sooner the expiry, the more risk you're taking on because you only have so much time for, for whatever you think your bet is to be true. And if not, your option basically becomes worthless. So the expiry date is very important. Um, so this one, for example, is a is a put option on on Arc Resources, uh, ARX. It's expiring on Friday, June seventeenth. Most websites will tell you how many days you have till expiry as well, um, just so you have that in mind. Um, the next thing that's important is is the strike price. So the strike price tells you at what. Well, let me back up a bit and and talk about what a put option is. So a put option, 
Oh, sorry, the Twitter just disconnected here. Um, so, so I put option, you're buying the option to sell something at a particular price in the future. So let's say you own something. It doesn't have to be a stock. Um, you know, let's say you own a, a house and you're looking at the market. You don't know what's really happening with the market. Um, you know, you're kind of interested in selling your house, but you're thinking, hey, you know, I think the house market might go up also, but it also might go down. So you don't want to take on this, this volatility risk, but you also don't want to sell your house. So what you're going to do is you're, you're going to buy a put option. So in the future. So what the put option gives you the option to is, is let's say you want to sell your house for, for $500,000 today. And you're not sure if you should sell it. That's what it's valued at. You're, you're getting offers for that, but you want to hold on to it. So what you do is you buy a put option in the future with a certain expiry date. So this one, for example, is June 17th. So you have a house, you wanna wait till June 17th to see what the market does, but you don't wanna take on the risk that the house price might go down in that time. So what, what you're gonna do is you're gonna buy a put option for June 17th at a certain price, and that is the strike price. So on, on stocks, it will be the actual value of the equity. Um, in this example with the house, it will be whatever price is the minimum price you want for your house. So let's say it's $500,000, you would buy a strike of $500,000 on that house. Similarly, on an option, you would buy whatever the minimum price you want for your stock on June 17th, 2022, which is the expiry of this option. But for you to buy this kind of option, which is essentially an insurance on the downside of your house, of your asset, of the stock, you're gonna to have to pay a little bit of a premium for that. And that's known as the option premium. So just like you pay for car insurance, just like you pay for house insurance that, you know, you wanna minimize your risk on a certain thing and you have to pay a fee for that, it's the same with options. You, you pay an option premium upfront and that gives you full flexibility that, okay, the minimum price I will get for my shares of ARC or for my house or for my car or whatever asset you have is going to be the strike price. So if you think about it kind of logically, the more risk you're willing to take and the lower price you're willing to go up to for that asset, the less premium you have to pay up front. You know, if, if your house is $500,000 and you want to take insurance that it's not going to drop below $400,000, you don't really have to pay very much because it's so far out of the market that, you know, people will give you that insurance policy pretty cheap. But if you say, no, if it's worth 500,000 today and I want 500,000 for it at the minimum, you know, in the next six months, you're going to have to pay a little bit more money up front to get that kind of insurance because there's someone on the other side of the trade that's kind of doing the insurance part of the business for you. So the expiry date is the date you're willing to go, that you want to go to. The strike price is kind of the minimum price you're willing to pay for your, for your equity. So if you buy an ARC, uh, ARX again, option for a $13 strike, that means that no matter what happens, if you own this option, you will get $13 for your share of ARC on June 17th or any time before that. You cannot go below that. So if the price of ARC drops to, let's say $2, you still get $13. If the price of ARC goes up to $20, you will get $20. So you have this upside potential, but you're minimizing your downside risk. So the price you pay for, for such kind of deal is the option premium that you have to pay up front. So it's kind of a deal where, you know, it seems like a win-win, like, look, 
you're, you're still keeping your upside potential and your downside is minimized, but you have to remember you're paying an option premium upfront to buy this kind of option, okay? And that's known as the option premium. Again, the, the price you pay upfront. The bid ask is the same as any stock. So, so the bid is what the, um, the buyer of this option is willing to pay. The ask is what the seller is, uh, the lowest price that the seller is willing to sell it for. And you know, if you've traded stocks, it's the exact same concept. Um, volume, again, exact same concept um, as shares. The one thing with volume that's different options to equities is that with options, one volume means 100 shares. So you, you multiply it by 100. Each, each options contract you buy is for 100 shares. It's not for one, one share of ARC. It's for 100 shares um, of ARX. So just keep that in mind when you're buying options. You might see the volume only be you know, 200 but that actually means there's 20,000 shares that have been uh, contracted in a way. The open interest column tells you how many total contracts are currently on the market open. So why is that important? That's important because a lot of options don't have the liquidity that stocks do. So if you buy a share of Synovus tomorrow, you can probably sell it at a pretty good price right away if you wanted to if you needed that money out. With options, it's not that easy. A lot of options are illiquid, which means that they don't really trade very much until closer to the expiry date. So once you get closer to the expiry date, they kind of start switching hands more, but until then they kind of just sit there and um, you, know, you don't really have a market to sell into unless you're willing to take a little bit of a bigger loss or, or sell below the market price in a way, especially if you end up buying a significant volume of the options. So what you wanna do is you wanna look at the open interest and kind of see which ones have a lot of open interest, which ones have a lot of volume to know the liquidity requirements. So if you're someone who doesn't really wanna hold options all the way till expiry, you wanna maintain that liquidity you wanna buy high volume, high open interest options. If you're someone who doesn't really care, like for you, it's like buying a, uh, a leveraged GIC in a way or a mutual fund, and you're okay with holding it all the way to expiry, then it doesn't really matter um, because by the time the expiry comes around, the options do get more liquid. They do get more open interest. So um, it all kind of depends on your perspective. A lot of options that I buy, I hold them pretty close to expiry or, in, or if I'm holding them for a, for a certain event like a Q3 results or a Q4 results, there's a lot of activity in these options during those times as well. So um, yeah, so it all kind of depends on your own personal perspective on that. Um, in the money option. So an in the money option is an option that that's already kind of in the money. So, so for put option, that would be an option that's above what the, what, the, uh, what the shares are currently trading at because you're trying to buy an option for something where your stock is already in the money at that point. As in, um, if you buy an option for ARX at $14 and it's currently trading at 1305, let's say, the option is already giving you a premium over the current, the current uh, share price. So the option is known as in the money. Whereas if you buy a strike that's below the current share price, that's known as an, as an out of the money option. And for call options, that's reversed. So just, just keep in mind the terminology kind of changes between call options and, and put options. And again, a put option gives you the option to sell something, whereas the, a, a call option gives you the option to buy something. So usually call options are known as bullish options because they're more of a positive outlook on the market and put options are known as bearish options 
they're more of a negative outlook that you think the prices might fall. So you want to have, you know, this, this insurance to sell at a certain price. So, you know, if someone, if someone like me is so bullish on the market, why, why am I even thinking about put options? Why, why am I looking at put options? So I'll give two examples as to where put options can be utilized to your benefit, even if you're very, very bullish on the market. Um, are there any questions so far um, on something? Can I explain something better here? And I guess I'll just caveat that by saying like options are not something you can just learn in a, in a 15, 20 minute seminar either. So there's a lot of nuances and you have to almost play around with the calculations on these options um, a little bit more on your, on your own time, go through kind of the risk reward of them to understand them a lot better. Um, but I'm kind of hoping to do the best I can here. Give a little intro. Okay. So the first way to use options, put options to your benefit is as a insurance. So let's say you hold shares of Synovus. Right now, Synovus in the US is trading at 1403 uh, US dollars. And you want insurance. You, you know, let's say you bought Synovus at, at $5. And the Zoom is really, or Twitter spaces keeps disconnecting. Um, sorry. So let's say you bought Synovus at $5. It's now $14. And you're thinking, look, um, you know, I've made a lot of money on this. The market looks a little toppy. And there's a bunch of uh, volatility in the broad market. Do I really want to keep holding Synovus? Or should I just sell the shares and call it a day? Uh, realize my profits. So you could do that. But if you want to hold on to the shares, you think, look, my Synovus could fall 20%, but also it could, we could have this relief rally here, a recovery, a lot of more money coming into the market, a rotation play, and Synovus could spike right up. So you don't want to sell it. And then, you know, two weeks later, Synovus is up 40%. And then you're, uh, you know, you're thinking to yourself, what's happened. So if you want to maintain that upside potential and you want to not have the downside risk, you would look at this $14 Synovus option. So what this $14 option does for you is until June 17th of this year, you will get $14 minimum for your uh, shares of Synovus. That's the insurance policy you're buying. To buy that policy, you have to pay somewhere between $1.75 and $1.85 um, per share upfront. Okay. So you're paying roughly, you know, 15% of the current share price to get six months of time. Is that a good deal? It all depends on your on your perspective. If you think Synovus in the next in the next uh, six months can go more than 15%, if you think it can go up 50% and you think this is a good good kind of risk reward there for you. And I'm gonna be building calculators for this as well, just as I did for the, the call options. I just haven't got to it. So um, it is coming and uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways you can look at this. You can say, okay, by June 17th, Synovus has to be at $14 plus whatever option you're paying for you to break even on this, on this option. And the other way you can look at it is that if Synovus drops and it goes down to 10 bucks, you still get $14 for, uh, for your shares, but you paid $1.75 upfront. So really you're, you're only getting $12.25, $14 minus $1.75, which you paid upfront or the insurance policy is kind of what you're getting on the share, but it gives you downside protection and the upside risk or the, the upside potential of the stock, you're not losing it by selling the share, you still hang on to it. So if you're bullish on the market, but you wanna not have that downside risk that can come with a, with a big drawdown in liquidity in the markets, with a um, some sort of other, phenomenon that can affect 
Canadian uh, share prices or whatever stock you're buying, it's a very nice insurance policy that's available for you. And you know, if you if you don't want to pay a dollar seventy five upfront, and you're okay with taking a little bit of a less lesser insurance policy, let's say you only want twelve dollars uh, minimum for your Sonova shares, you're you're willing to take a fifteen percent loss um, from the current share price. That policy is on sale for only eighty cents um, a share, and the further down you go, the less you pay, obviously. Um, so. You know, that's that's kind of the, the best way to explain it. It's it's an insurance policy for you if you want to maintain your upside potential while minimizing your downside risk. Because once you buy one of these options, you cannot get less money than what the option uh, strike price is. You will get that money as a minimum um, for that share. And then if the stock price continues to climb and keeps going up, well, then your insurance policy was basically, you lost the option premium, but you kind of, you know, maybe you got peace of mind off it. Maybe you, you um, um, end up uh, exercising the option. Um, so there's a question here. Do you need to hold the underlying asset on the same brokerage account at the time of expiry to be able to exercise the option? Um, okay. Need to hold this. Do you need to hold the underlying asset on the same brokerage account at the time of expiry to be able to exercise the option? So yes, I believe that's the case. Yes. So if you're exercising this option, you would have to hold the shares of Synovus that that you're actually selling at this price. However, if you don't have the shares and you just bought the option for whatever reason, you can just sell the option. the The option is going to trade at the exact kind of same ratio. There's not much arbitrage in there for uh, um, for people to kind of exploit. Um, so I think there's a comment here that, that you can cash settle. So um, I believe that's also an option. That's also something you can do that if you don't have the shares, you, you can settle the option in cash. However, I will say that for most banks um, in Canada anyways, you're better off selling the option as opposed to um, exercising it because exercising options comes with its own fees. And some of those fees can be quite substantial at times. So um, as far as I understand, you're, you're better off selling the option, but the, uh, the, the, it's open for you to, to settle it on cash. And I also think if you own the underlying asset, um, you can also settle it against that asset and the kind of both both uh, settle as one uh, one piece. Um, there's a question here about, do I ever write cash covered puts to get into a position? So yeah, so I will get into that here in the next, uh, next slide. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. So that's the one way to look at put options is the, um, is the insurance way of doing things. If you already own the asset, you wanna buy insurance on it, you buy the put option. Now, what's the other way we can utilize put options? So we can actually write put options. So instead of buying options, you can also sell options because obviously when, when you're buying an option, someone on the other side is selling that to you and that's known as writing options. So you wanna make sure with your brokerage that you, if you're, in, if you're interested in options, you need permission to both buy and sell options. Uh, so buying options and writing options, two different things. They come with their own kind of risk, uh, risk matrix that the banks use. I think within TFSAs, you can buy options, but you can't write options uh, if I'm correct. And if someone knows if I'm wrong on that, please uh, chime in there. Um, but so the other way you do it is you write options. So why would you write options? So Okay, let's say, let's say you don't have cash right now. You're, you're fully, you're fully uh, have your money in the market. You have a few dollars sitting around, but, but not enough to buy, like, you know, you wanna buy 10,000 shares of Synovus. You don't have the cash for it, but you see huge potential in Synovus. 
over the next or in CNRL for the next 12 months. So what do you do? So you can get money on margin uh, and trade it. You can get monies from a uh, line of credits and, and trade that. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to go into that sort of uh, margin liquidity kind of uh, potential of a, of a default on that, you know, it's just too risky for you, you write options. So what does that mean? Let's take an example of this CNRL option. The expiry is on January 20th, 2023. So you basically have 365 days from today. And the strike price is 75. The bid is 24.50 and the ask is 29. So what does that mean? That means that if you write this option today, for a strike price of 75, and the current price again is 50.79. So you're writing an option that's roughly $25 um, in the money. And someone is willing to pay you between $24 and $29 today for you to write this option per share. So someone today is coming to you and they're saying, look, I want insurance on my CNRL shares would you be willing to write me a contract? And you say, okay, at what price? And the person says, well, I want it at, at $75 strike and I'm willing to pay you roughly $26, $27 for it today, a share. So you're not paying for this option. You're actually getting money for this option. And you're now taking on the risk by, by writing this option. So you're taking on the risk and for taking on that risk, you get the insurance policy premiums. So, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talking um, that they hate insurance companies and everything is rigged. Um, so, you know, here's your option. Here's your, your play to be an insurance company by, by writing options. And again, this is not a recommendation. This is, I'm just sharing my opinion, um, kind of throwing ideas out there on what people are doing in the markets. So you can be more, more familiar with these things. Um, so, yeah. What's, what's the risk you're taking? The risk you're taking is that CNRL shares fall further. So if someone gives you $27 for this option and the strike price is 75, what you do is you, you subtract 27 from 75, so you get 48. If CNRL is at $48 or higher, you're basically breaking even on, uh, on this option. Uh, by next year, by January 20th, 2023. If CNRL dips below that, if CNRL goes to $20, well, now CNRL, a share of CNRL is worth $20, but this person who bought the option from you is gonna sell this share to you for $75 next year on January 20th, 2023. They're gonna sell this share to you for 75, which they have full rights to because you sold them the insurance on it and you know now you're you have this share of CNRL with you that you paid seventy five dollars for um, a year from today and it's only worth twenty in the market so you've lost fifty five dollars so you're basically in the red fifty five dollars however you got an option premium up front of twenty seven dollars so you're down your shares are down fifty five but you got a premium up front of twenty seven so really you lost $28 a share. So that's your risk there, is that if CNRL falls further or if it falls from where it is today, you're, you're gonna be paying out this insurance policy. So what's the reward against that? The reward is that if CNRL goes above $75 by January 20th, 2023, which depending on your oil macro outlook, depending on your kind of understanding of the company, where you see the shares going, um, it, it could feasibly close above $75 by next January, right? And if you're buying shares, if you're looking to buy shares in CNRL, I'm assuming you're bullish anyway. So this is another way to buy shares where, where you don't have to put the money up front. So to get back to the example, if CNRL closes above $75 on January 20th, 2023, the person who owns this insurance policy is not going to exercise it because why would they sell you the share at 75 
if it's trading at $80 in the market or $85 in the market, they would rather sell the shares in the market at 85 than to sell it to you for 75. So this option is gonna expire worthless and you take your $27 that they gave you today and you stuff it in the bank and it's just free money for you. You, you, know, you don't have to do anything with it. You, you were able to get cash today and if, if CNRL closes above 75 in, uh, in a year from today on the expiry date, you're basically sitting there laughing because uh, you just wrote this insurance policy that did not have any claims on it and you took $27 a share off somebody today. Um, you know, so, sounds like a pretty good deal. So it's, uh, you know, again, it's about your own risk reward. If, if you think the stock is gonna go up past 75 or 70, like you can write, <clears throat> you can write options. <clears throat> you can write options for uh, $55, $60, 65, 70, you know, depending on your own risk kind of tolerance. If you think CNRL is absolutely gonna blow things out of the water, you write, um, <clears throat> holy, you write um, more in the money options and you collect the option premium and that's money in the bank for you today. You don't have to wait. Uh, you don't have to wait. And the only thing you're, you're praying and hoping for is that a year from today, the, uh, the stock closes above the strike price and the, the option goes unexercised and you're sitting there with the money and uh, you don't have to do anything at that point. And a lot of people that I hear about are, are using this writing uh, put strategy to, um, to kind of just collect premiums and pay off their bills or, or whatever they're doing, which is kind of strange in a way because they're, they're betting on the market continuing to go up. But if you're holding oil equities, isn't that kind of what you're betting on anyways, in a way? You're, you're thinking that over time, over the short to mid to long long run, these equities are gonna go up. That's, that's what you're betting on anyways. So it's just another way of doing things. If, if you don't have the cash up front um, to buy the amount of shares you would like, you can actually collect money instead and, and write these insurance policies um, against these equities. And um, you know, this is available for, for any, any equity out there. Uh, the, the, uh, the US options are a little bit more traded so any company that's dual listed, Canada and US, like uh, CNRL, Synovus, uh, Vermilion, um, Enterplus, they have a lot more volume to them on the US side. And also something I should say about, about uh, options is that if you own an option or if you write options, you don't get the dividend from that. So, so if you own a call option on something, on a, on a stock and the stock is paying a 7% dividend, you do not get the dividend on that. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your kind of risk reward calculations. Um, a lot of options are actually going to be better for you. And again, this is just my opinion, are going to be better for you if you buy the non-dividend paying entities or low paying dividend entities, which is kind of one of the reasons why if you look at my options portfolio, I have options on ARCs or ARX on Synovus, you know, which I really like because these companies don't pay that much of a dividend. So they're almost a better risk reward. And I like companies that are doing share buybacks because when you do share buybacks, the share price goes up. And if you're buying call options or you're writing put options, that's what you want. You want the actual share price to go up not for the money to be distributed in dividends. So, you know, for example, a company like Tourmaline, you definitely don't want to buy um, um, call options on them, you know, or I wouldn't anyways, because they just keep giving out all the cash they make. Instead of appreciating the share price, they keep giving out special dividends and such. So, you know, just be careful with that. A couple of things that I've noticed um, in the past. And, um, yeah, that's kind of all, all I had. Are there any other questions? Anyone wants to chime in um, on the Zoom if you've been uh, 
if you maybe wrote options in the past or you bought puts against your um, assets, um, anything you want to share, kind of your your um, experience with them? Or if not, I'll just open it up to other questions. And if there aren't any, then uh, yeah, nice little short session and it'll be posted on um, on the website. I will try to get the put options calculators out for both these methods um, in the next couple of weeks, um, put them out. And uh, that'll just give give people a chance to play around a little bit more with uh, you know with the actual calculations part of it without doing them kind of in their head. Um, cool. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions on the on the um, or sorry, there is so um, there's a question here on the Zoom on. What is the minimum I look for in options volume? So the minimum that I would look for is that the, the volume is not so much important because the volume changes so much day to day. You wanna look at the open interest in a way. If the open interest is like 20 to 40 times the amount of contracts I'm buying, I'm usually pretty happy with that for, a, for more of the shorter term contracts. If it's, if it's something that's more of a long dated contract that I'm willing to hold, for example, this, this January, 2023 contract that I'm willing to hold for a while, I don't really worry about the, the volume or the open interest because I'm gonna hold it anyways. So I'm not looking for a seller right away. And as it gets closer again, there will be more, more buyers and sellers. And, you know, sometimes, as you get closer to expiry, there's a lot of robots and, and algorithms that kind of come into the market trying to make one cent or half a cent off your option. So you usually have liquidity at that point. You know, you might have to give up a cent or two or, or half a cent just to be able to sell those contracts or buy them back in a way. But you can usually always find liquidity closer to the dates um, of expiry. So on the volume side, um, I usually try and buy big blocks of options if I'm gonna go in to, to a trade. So when I'm looking for the ask price and how many contracts are trading, I want there to be at least the amount of contracts that I'm looking to buy because there's a good chance you might put an, op, uh, a, an order for 40 contracts and you only get one because that's all that's, that's being sold at this ask price. So make sure, you know, you, you wanna try and buy options, like how many ever contracts you wanna buy, you wanna try and wait until there's that many for sale all as one block, because that, that will make sure you get your order filled. If not, again, just my opinion, you're taking on a risk that, that maybe the, you know, you get one contract or two contracts, and then you're sitting there, you know, thinking about what to do with these uh, um, the next day. Um, okay, do you think that selling monthly cash, secur cash secured puts in these US listed Canadian names is a good strategy considering the sketchy market conditions over the next few months? So I can give you my two cents. It's something I've thought about very, very deeply. I think I wouldn't sell monthly puts, but more like a, a six month in the future kind of put or a three month in the future, or, or even these 2023 puts, um, it does lock up your cash for uh, a significant period of time. But, you know, for, for someone that doesn't wanna deal with the volatility of the day to day, like what, what's happening in day to day, and maybe it's affecting you in, a, in, your, in your kind of your, your mental game, if it's affecting your sleep in a way, um, you know, if you're not, if you want to play the oil market and the oil equities, but you don't want to be, you know, constantly looking at your screen for these for this volatility that's common in oil and gas stocks, um, I think it is definitely a good way to play it. Um, the monthly secured puts, maybe it's something you're comfortable with. I will switch it up and say, I'm not comfortable buying buying options on a monthly basis. So therefore 
I'm not comfortable selling puts on a monthly basis because there is just way too much volatility on a on a week to week or a month to month basis that I would not be comfortable with with such a sort of strategy. But if you ask me, where is the oil market going to be three or six or twelve months down the road? Um, you know, I I'm a lot more comfortable with with selling puts on that that kind of time frame. Um, if you ask me, have I wrote puts so far? No, I I found better risk reward on the call options, the long dated um, at the money or or in the money call options. But I think um, if I ran into a, an issue with with money, with liquidity, and I wanted to make a huge bet on on one of these names without putting significant dollars down, um, it's definitely something that I I, I run kind of, I run these uh, calculations on the go. And, um, you know, if I see something that's, that's totally mispriced come into the market, I, I don't see why I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for, uh, for something like that. But um, yeah, so hopefully that, that answers these questions. Um, any favorite or go-to resources for options? Um, I like TD Web Broker. It's, it's, it's what I use anyway. And um, for writing puts, what's nice is that I will put in a kind of a, a projected trade in there and it tells me exactly how much cash I need to secure my, uh, me writing puts. Whereas if I'm trying to calculate it on my own, it's just a complete waste of time. So I like TD, um, tmxmoney.com is a good one for the Canadian options. Uh, Yahoo Finance has good stuff um, for the US side. Um, and that, that portfolio, portfolio option calculator, I forget exactly what the, what the URL is, but, um, that has really good, good, um, risk reward charts. So you put in which option you want to buy or sell, and it it will give you the percentage gains and losses, depending on how the underlying equity moves. Um, barchart.com has some nice options page and info. Okay. I will have a look at that. Uh, maybe I'll add a link onto my onto my website to that. Um, that's good to know. Um, cool. Yeah, that's the one. Optionsprofitcalculator.com. Um, it's pretty, and it's got it's pretty much got every option under the book. Um, I don't know if it's got Canadian options, but the U.S. side for sure, which is what I mostly trade because of the more volume, more open interest, uh, more liquidity in those options. Um, yeah, so, well, thanks everyone for joining on the Zoom. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end the recording on the Zoom and we'll continue on the Twitter spaces for anyone interested. Um, yeah, thanks again for joining, happy Sunday and uh, we'll see you at the next one.